Uh, well, it's a pleasure to uh, be with you all in the Lord's house this evening. And if you have your Bibles, would you turn to he- uh, Ephesians chapter 2 with me? Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Hopefully, uh, the audio is going out on the live stream, but I think it might be, uh, I think it might not be uh, tonight. Um, But tonight, we're continuing our study on uh, Romanism, on the Roman Catholic Church. And tonight, we've come to uh, one of the last uh, sections in our study. We may uh, may look into one more section next week. Uh, But tonight, we're looking at uh, really three topics that are all put together in Romanism, and that is Mary, the saints, and the treasury of merit, as the Roman Catholic Church teaches it. Uh, This has to do with what our relationship as believers are to the saints who are in heaven. And so if you have your Bibles in Ephesians chapter 2, we'll begin reading in verse 18 together. The scripture says, For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And now let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you for uh, your word that you've given to us. We thank you for uh, even the saints that have gone before us. We Thank you that by your grace they persevered to the end and that they're uh, seated uh, at your right hand now, Lord. Uh, We pray that uh, we would all uh, take encouragement from them and uh, be able to be strengthened by our fellowship with them in Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray tonight that you would help us to have a right understanding of them, uh, Lord, but a greater understanding of Jesus Christ uh, who saved us. Lord, we pray that where we've sinned against you this week that you'd forgive us and that you'd wash us from it. Lord, we pray that you would help us to have fellowship even with those who couldn't make it here tonight. Uh, Lord, that they would uh, know their fellowship with us in Jesus. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would help us all to be able to do your will the rest of this week, especially that we can bear witness to Jesus Christ by the preaching of the gospel. Lord, we pray that uh, if there are any lost in here, that you would draw them, that they would be saved. Uh, Lord, be with our missionaries in the way that you always are to give them the things that they need if they ask of you. And Lord, we pray that you'd be with our nation uh, to help us to uh, turn back to Jesus Christ. We love you and thank you for all things. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the topic of Mary and the saints. Um, In particular, tonight what we're asking is, what role do the saints have in uh, the salvation of Christ's people. Uh, in, the, in the way that God saves the church, uh, what role does uh, do the saints play, if any role, in the saving work of Christ? And we're beginning, as we always have, uh, by looking at the Romanist view. What do the Romans, uh, the Romanists, the Roman Catholics, say about Mary and the saints? And what they say is that the saints are intercessors for us, They are benefactors to us, and that they are objects of veneration, that they are objects of religious honor. Um, And to start with that, we we need to recognize this idea that I mentioned at the beginning, that is the treasury of merit. What does that mean? Uh, The only ones in the church that are recognized as saints are those who have already lived the Christian life, They've passed on before us, uh, and they have made it to be with the Father in heaven. They have, uh, they have merited enough, they have cooperated with the grace of God enough, so that they, at the moment, right now, are in his presence with Christ. This means, of course, they had enough merit. They, they, they did enough to cooperate with God's grace. But it also means that because they did enough 
to, to merit that spot in heaven, to, to, to make it to heaven, the thinking goes that they may have had some extra merit that they accrued in this life or in purgation, uh, that they uh, did enough for themselves and more so, that, that, that they merited above what was necessary for their personal salvation. And so this merit that is over and above what they needed is called the treasury of merit. Uh, it, it, it is the works of the saints, the merits of the saints in heaven, uh, that they have extra from their own salvation. And this, this is what the treasury of merit is. And this treasury uh, is said by the church that, that the church is able to dispense merit from this treasury. They are able to give from this treasury of merit. Uh, within the treasury of merit also includes the, the righteousness of Christ, the infinite merit that he merited before God, but it also includes that of Mary and the other saints. Uh, in the Catholic Catechism, section 956, uh, the text reads, The intercession of the saints, being more closely united to Christ, those who dwell in heaven fix the whole church more firmly on holiness. They do not cease to intercede with the Father for us, as they prefer the right, uh, profer the right, the the merits which they acquired on earth through the one mediator between God and men, Christ Jesus. So by their fraternal concern is our re our weakness greatly helped. So they are in heaven. They pray before God there, and they are able to pray that God would transfer their merits that they preferred in this life to the saints who are in need. In section 1476 of the same, it says, we also call these spiritual goods of the communion of saints the church's treasury, which is not the sum, to not the sum total of material goods which have accumulated during the course of the centuries. On the contrary, the treasury of the church is the infinite value which can never be exhausted, which Christ's merits have before God. They were offered so that the whole of mankind could be set free from sin and attain communion with the Father. In Christ, the Redeemer himself, the satisfaction and merits of his redemption uh, exist and find their efficacy. So in that treasury of merit are first the righteousness of Christ. And in section 477, it says this treasury includes as well, includes as well the prayers and good works of of the blessed Virgin Mary, they are truly immense, in unfathomable, and even pristine in their value before God. In the treasury, too, are the prayers and good works of all the saints, all those who have followed in the footsteps of Christ the Lord, and by his grace have made their lives holy and carried out the mission the Father entrusted to them. In this way, they attained their own salvation and at the same time cooperated in saving their brothers in the unity of the mystical body. So uh, in, in that long quote there, it says, Christ's merits are in the treasury, but also the pristine merits, the unfathomable merits of Mary, and the merits of all the saints. And that these merits are to cooperate in the saving work of the church, that they have a role to play in God saving the church. It's not just the merits of Christ, but it's the merits of Mary and the saints under Catholicism. Even um, the, the idea of pray, praying to the saints and, and giving veneration to the saints in the church that we'll see in a moment, they have to do with asking and receiving the merits of Mary and the saints, that, that they are given grace from uh, God through the saints uh, in order to live the Christian life, in order to, to finally make it to salvation. And so the saints are also to be given worship, or, or as they would put it, veneration in the Roman Catholic Church. This is, this is the, a distinction in the church. There, there are two kinds of, 
of honor that can be rendered uh, in Catholicism. One is latria, which is the, the, the worship only due to God, and there is a lower kind of honor, a creaturely honor, that is given to the saints, which is called dulia, uh, that, that they are uh, rendered honor from the church. In section 192 of the Catechism, it says, Sacred images in our churches and homes are intended to awaken and nourish our faith in the mystery of Christ. Through the icon of Christ and his works of salvation, it is he whom we adore. Through sacred images of the Holy Mother of God, of the angels, and of the saints, we venerate the persons represented. And so when they say that we... they they go to images, they uh, give veneration to these images, that they, they're to do this and that in doing it, they render honor also to Christ. And Mary, in particular, you'll notice even before, she's given a, a special place in this whole ordeal. Her merits, uh, her good works, her role in the salvation of the church uh, is set above all of the other saints, and so she uh, is also rendered greater honor. And this is because of the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, that Mary was born without original sin, and that she never committed actual sins in her life. In section 491, the Catechism says, Through the centuries, the Church has become ever more aware that Mary, full of grace, through God, was redeemed from the moment of her conception. That is what the dogma of the Immaculate Conception confesses, as Pope Pius uh, IX proclaimed in 1854. And he says, The most blessed Virgin Mary was, from the first moment of her conception, by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God, and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. And so Mary was born, she was conceived even, uh, without any stain. She, she, she received grace from God so that she could be conceived without any stain of original sin, and she was kept from actual sin in her life. And of course, this implies, again, that because Mary uh, received enough grace uh, that she was uh, she was kept from sin uh, in her uh, conception and throughout her life, that she already uh, had enough merit given to her right from the start in order to enter into heaven. And so in Catholicism, all of the, the meritorious works of Mary uh, are stored up in the treasury, uh, and they are all accessible to the saints for uh, their salvation to be given to them. And so for uh, this reason, uh, informally, um, many in the church see Mary as having uh, a very high uh, cooperation, a, a very high role in the salvation of the church uh, because of this extraordinary merit that she had in her life. In the Catechism 968, we read, her, whole, or her role in relation to the church and to all humanity goes still further. In a wholly singular way, she cooperated by her obedience, faith, hope, and burning charity in the Savior's work of restoring supernatural life to souls. For this reason, she is a mother to us in the order of Grace. She cooperated by her obedience, her faith, her charity, uh, her works in the saving work that Jesus did for us. That she actually contributed to Christ's saving work towards his people. In section 969, then it says, This motherhood of Mary in the order of grace continues uninterruptedly from the consent which she loyally gave to the, at the Annunciation and which she sustained without wavering beneath the cross until the eternal fulfillment of all the elect. Taken up to heaven, she did not lay aside this saving office, but by her manifold intercessions continues to bring us the gifts 
of eternal salvation. Therefore, the blessed virgin is involved in the church under the title of advocate, helper, benefactress, and mediatrix. Uh, you can see that it's, she's an advocate, she's a helper, she advocates for the church before God, and mediatrix means that she is a mediator between God and men. And so because of this, again, Mary holds a very high role among even the saints which are in heaven, uh, and so she's been given many uh, titles, uh, including the title of Queen of Heaven uh, in Catholicism. In the Catechism, uh, uh, section 971, we even read that she is due a particular honor above all other saints. All generations will call me blessed. The church's devotion to the blessed virgin is intrinsic to Christian worship. The church rightly honors the blessed virgin with special devotion. From the most ancient times, the blessed virgin has been honored with the title of mother of God, to whose protection the faithful fly in all their dangers and needs. And with that, we've finally reached our uh, end of reading these uh, statements from the Catholic Church, but you see that she is rendered special honor. And remember earlier we spoke about how God is rendered latria, he is rendered worship, and all of the saints are rendered dulia, or veneration. Well, Mary has a particular kind of veneration that they render to her. They render to her hyperdulia, uh, or, or the highest form of veneration that can be given to a created being. And so they make this distinction uh, there that she is uh, rendered the highest honor that can be due to uh, a created thing. And so this is the view of uh, the church with regard to the treasury of merit and the saints and Mary. And so with that, I think we can already begin to see some difficulties that this poses for the biblical view. That is the, the, the biblical truth that the saints are not, uh, they are not our Savior. Uh, the saints do not save us. They are not uh, worthy of uh, anything resembling worship to God. Uh, rather, they are our fellow citizens, as we read earlier in Ephesians. As we said, uh, several, have already said several times in this look at Roman Catholicism, Christ's is the only merit that counts anything towards our salvation, that is involved in saving us at all. Romans 3.21 says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He says the righteousness of God is manifest. The righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. This is what saves us. And this singular righteousness, this one righteousness by which we are saved, is borne witness to by the prophets. The prophets' merits are not what save us. The prophets don't offer their merits for the salvation of the church, Rather, they point to the righteousness of God. They point us to Jesus Christ who saves us. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The righteousness of God. The singular righteousness of God. And the scripture never speaks anywhere of the merit of the saints, the merit of any other thing, being for the salvation of God's people. The idea of grace itself even precludes, as we've noted before, it precludes any merit from creatures. God is gracious. God is the one that saves us. And so the, the, the righteousness of the saints means uh, nothing with regard to our salvation. Romans 11.6 says, If by grace, then it is no more of works, Otherwise, grace is no more grace, but if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. 
this is with regard to our works, our efforts to uh, be saved. It does not count for our works. Our own works are not counted for grace and the works of any other created being, of any saint in the world. Uh, they are not counted towards the grace of God. It is only God's grace. It is only God's work in Jesus Christ that saves us. More than this, of course, we know that, uh, that Mary, and we looked at this a couple weeks ago on Mother's Day, Mary was a sinner just like all of us. The, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is ill-conceived. Uh, Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. And John 2 verse 3 says, When they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. So the scripture says, All are sinners. All have come short of the glory of God. There is none that seeks after God on their own uh, power. And even here in John chapter 2, Mary is documented as sinning against Christ. When they wanted wine, she came to Jesus trying to pro uh, provoke him and so have some uh, glory in saving the feast in Christ working a miracle. And Jesus admonishes her. Softly, of course, he admonishes her, but he admonishes her nonetheless. Woman, what have I to do with thee? Uh, what does the glory of Christ have to do with Mary? What Christ does is to his glory and his glory alone. And you'll notice even this sin that Mary committed at, the, at this feast is exactly what the Romanist uh, is claiming, is, is, is doing. That the glory of Christ's saving work towards his people is somehow associated with the work of Mary. That Mary cooperated in the saving work of Christ. That, that she had a part at the cross in, in the salvation of Christ's people. And this is just uh, not the case. And it's the same sin that Mary herself was ad admonished about by Jesus. Mary herself even uh, recognized that she was a sinner, that she fell short of God's glory. Uh, Luke 1.46, Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. She needed the saving work of God towards her. Why? Because she had sinned. Because she was like all of us. She needed the grace of God on her. And so she, uh, none of her merits counted for anything before God. None of her merits uh, brought her to uh, salvation. It was all by God's grace. All because God is a Savior. And so uh, Mary uh, and the saints that we can see, uh, none of them stand to be uh, at all worthy uh, to be our uh, co-redeemers, to, to be uh, our mediators before God, to be uh, merit workers on our behalf. That's only Christ's office. That's only what he has done for us. And so for this reason also, I think we can see that the veneration of saints and particularly prayers that are offered to saints in order to, to obtain merit from them, is an idolatrous activity. Exodus 20, verse 4, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Uh, just as we saw last week with the Lord's table and the idea of adoring the host, adoring the bread and wine, uh, making an image of the saints in order to bow down to them, in order to worship and pray to the saints, uh, is unbiblical. Only worship is due to God. Only religious honor is due to him and none else. This, this, of course, doesn't mean that we can't have pictures 
of our family members, and it doesn't even mean that we can't have pictures of uh, the saints uh, to, to remember them by. Um, we, can, we can have pictures of preachers from the past. We can uh, see what they looked like. We can even thank God that he uh, put them forth as an example to us. But we are not to venerate them. We're not to bow down to them or worship them or pray to them. And particularly prayer is uh, problematic in this uh, because prayer in the scripture is a form of worship that is only due to God. Only He is worthy to receive our prayers. In Matthew 6, verse 9, we read, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. In a maximal way, he says, pray you like this. If we pray, then we should pray after this form, after this template. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. And in verse 13, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Only God is mentioned there. Only praying to him and petitioning him for what we need. Only giving him honor by prayer. And so, uh, it, it, if we're to pray like this, we ought to pray only to God. Also, of course, we can look at all the various examples of prayer in the scripture, uh, and how they are only given to God. In Psalm 9, verse 1, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. Uh, the only prayers that are offered and, and uh, offered uh, righteously in the scripture are offered to God alone. Uh, And this is plainly seen by a a final point about worship in prayer being only due to God. And that is because the scripture uses the image of burnt incense to God to to represent worship to him. In Revelation 8 verse 3, another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints. Unto the gold, upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Uh, prayers are offered only to God. They go to him uh, in, in heaven. And they're likened here to incense that's burnt in the temple. Smoke which is for the Lord to smell. And this... Uh, office in the temple was only meant for God. The incense that was burnt in God's temple was only for him. It was not for anyone else. It was for his glory. In Exodus 30 and verse 37, as for the perfume, that is the, the incense which is burnt on the altar, which thou shalt make Ye shall not make to yourselves according to the uh, composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make uh, make like unto that to smell thereto shall even be cut off from his people. Uh, And so prayers to uh, God are the only valid prayers. Uh, Anyone who makes like, who offers this, in any other context, uh, even uh, it, to his own family members, uh, to, to those who have gone on and passed before us, uh, that they shall be utterly cut off in this passage. And so it, prayers are only for God. They're, they're a kind of worship that only he is worthy of. And so again, the, uh, the offering of prayers and veneration to the saints Uh, is repugnant to Scripture. Also, the role of the saints, as we've seen, as mediators is flatly unbiblical. The Scripture strictly denies any other person serving a role of mediator for the people of God. 1 Timothy 2.5, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He is the only mediator, the one and only 
Jesus Christ who intercedes for us before God. Hebrews 4.14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He doesn't say, go to the saints. And have them pray for you. He doesn't say, send Mary to go and placate Christ and to obtain mercy for you. But rather, he says, let us come boldly, directly to the throne of grace. Come directly to Jesus Christ. He is a merciful high priest. He will receive you. And so you come to him and he is your mediator. The only mediator between God and man. The God-man, Christ Christ. Jesus. And so finally with this, uh, we see that, 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 that the role that the saints play in Roman Catholicism, uh, it encroaches in just about every way on Christ's work to save his people. The perfect work that he did on the cross for us. It, it, it moves in on his territory and it takes it uh, for Mary and the saints, which we all know that Mary and the saints w- would despise that, 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 that they hate that people think that about them. And so finally, let's, let's come to two final scriptures uh, in our study tonight. And let's see what the scripture does say about what footing the saints stand on uh, and that we stand on also. First, I'll note that in the scripture that we are all called saints. That we who are on the earth, who trust in Jesus Christ, who have his grace on us, his spirit with us, that we are all called saints before him, set apart for his purposes. But also, as we read at the beginning, we see that all the saints are on an equal footing in heaven before God. Ephesians 2.18 says, For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. By the work of the Spirit, communicating our presence into heaven, to be fellow citizens with all the saints, with all the household of God, we come before his throne. We have access to him through the Spirit. And so we are no more strangers and foreigners. We're not cut off from the saints who are in heaven, uh, as if they have one status before God, and we have another status before God, that we have a a secondary status, a status that relies on the saints in heaven. Rather, we are all the same before God. We We are part of his household every bit as much as they are, so that we need not rely on their workings in heaven. Hebrews 12.1 also says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every uh, every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So what that passage in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says is seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, seeing that we're in the same household with all of these saints of God in, he- in heaven and on earth, uh, that, that, that we share in the same status before God. It says, let us run the race set before us, and while we're doing so, we look to Jesus. We don't look to these other saints. We don't rely on them. We look squarely at him. He has finished the work. It says that he is the author and finisher of our faith. He began it and he will bring it to its fulfillment. And so in him, the whole Christian life is fulfilled. The whole Christian life is is his to work in us. And so we don't rely on the saints. We don't rely on Mary. We only rely on Jesus Christ. Let us run the race that's set before us, looking to him. 
He's the only one that the scripture admonishes us to look to for grace to help in time of need. And so, believers, tonight, uh, as we come to a close, uh, we may be tempted sometimes uh, to think that uh, we need to, to petition the saints, uh, that we, we need to, to go to some other power other than Christ in order to help us. Uh, we may even be tempted to think that if we don't have the, uh, the uh, support and, and graces that are given to us through our brothers and sisters on the earth, that we won't make it somehow. But rather what the scripture says is look to Christ, trust in him, come to prayer in him, and so we will receive what we need. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the savior, the exclusive savior of the body, and we need nothing else. And so tonight I simply want to call us to look to Jesus Christ in the same if there are any Roman Catholics who uh, watch this video later. And uh, if there are any unbelievers in here, I have the exact same, uh, I have the exact same admonition to you, uh, that you would look to Jesus Christ, that you would uh, have all of your goodness, all of mercy that is given from God is given by Jesus Christ. And so look to him, trust in him. Uh, as we read earlier, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. Even Mary was a sinner, a sinner, and she confessed that she needed a Savior, that God was her Savior. If you do not come to Him, if you do not have Jesus Christ, then you do not have salvation. And so come to Him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He is a merciful high priest and will receive you. And so with that, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you once again and we thank you for Christ. Lord, we thank you for all his people. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would help us to uh, be admonished uh, by the saints that went before us. Be admonished by the saints that are with us right now and uh, in our context, Lord. Uh, that you would help us to be admonished not to rely on anything else, but to look squarely to Jesus Christ for our salvation. Help us to lay aside all of the things that we think are meritorious, Lord. We pray that you would help us to uh, only trust in him and what he's done. Lord, we ask that if there are any lost in here that listen later, that do not know him, that are still dead in their sins, uh, Lord, that you would waken their heart by the Holy Ghost and have them look to him in faith, uh, that they would be saved. Lord, we pray that where we've sinned against you again, you'd forgive us. Lord, that you would keep us until the day of Christ. And Lord, we pray for those in our church family that couldn't make it tonight. Lord, that you would keep them safe and give them comfort and help them know the fellowship they have with us. And it's in Christ's name we pray it all. Amen.